Welcome back to my channel. Hi guys, how are you all doing? Um, it's a different vlog now and I, you know, I'm still not done with my balcony. But um, I need to pick up a few things for an upcoming recipe. I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, but I'd love to try it. And so I need to pick up a couple of things. Um, um, not too much. I'm hoping to find small portions of what I want to use because I'm not going to plan to make a, a, an entire um, recipe. So it's an Italian recipe and it's a bolognese sauce. So um, anyway, I'm going to be trying that this weekend and um, I need to pick up a few things. need to pick up a couple of things at Walmart. I have to go to a Walmart and um, because I've been putting this off I need um, liquid plant food and um, it's been since January that I used that entire bottle and um, my basil is not looking too great so um, I'm going to not water it tomorrow and see how that does. Um, so I need that and um, I also need some cat grass and treats for Micha. And that's about it. So I, I'm figuring the recipe ingredients, I'll be picking them up a little bit at a time because um, uh, it requires going to a special place. Um, with uh, where Italian foods are sold. So I'm gonna see if I can check that out now and then whatever else I need, I'll buy another time. Uh, I have until Friday, Saturday, so um, that's my agenda. And so tonight I'll probably be starting another missing child case and um, all I have to do is pick one. There's an awful lot of them. Um, so um, from now on, bear in mind what I told you yesterday uh, about the um, two spirits. I, I really do think there's a lot in that. So anyway, guys, I'll catch up with you later on. Um, I'm not sure exactly where, but I will. I'm back home and um, I got a couple of hauls here and I've already shown you one but I'll show them I'll show you the items again and um, hold on I'll let you have a look 
So guys, um, my first stop was at the local grocery store and I picked up these three items. Well, this is for my soup. It's not for that recipe. I picked up tomatoes and um, I also picked up uh, another package of lasagna shoots, which I'm going to put in the freezer just, you know, for later. I have, um, it, they're very hard to find. Um, because I don't have a pasta machine, I'm stocking up on these. And so um, that came to $13.05. And so then I um, swung by uh, Walmart and I picked up some more ingredients for the recipe, but I still have one more that I need. And so um, first of all, I picked up the tweets for Nietzsche. I got a couple of packages and then I got myself some peanuts and um, then I got the plant food and um, this is the middle sized one and uh, this one lasted me oh my goodness I've had the other one since January exactly this size and so I, I think it um, lasted me quite a long time so I decided to get the same size. And um, then I got carrots. One is for my soup and the other is for the recipe. I got mushrooms. And then I, um, that's my supper for tonight. I'm not really that hungry. And um, I did also swing by to um, get a bottle of red wine, which is for the recipe. And so, um, well, all the Walmart items came to $31.05, and this was $3.67. I bought a little one because I'm not fond of red wine, so there you go. Those are my two hauls. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these things in the re refrigerator, and I'm also going to do a little research. I'll make my soup. And um, my soup from the cup of noodles. And then I'm going to get back at you um, regarding another case. Hi, guys. I'm back. And so... Um, tonight we're going to discuss the first part of a different case, and, um, I don't believe that, um, uh, this girl that went missing, um, had the same issues going on with her that Tammy did, but they are linked in the way that they, um, both went missing in a similar kind of way. And um, during the time that one um, serial attacker was actually active, um, now this happened, this particular abduction or attack happened in 1996, and it's still a cold case. Um, it happened three years before Tammy went missing. And so... Um, throughout those years, this one gentleman that we will talk about much later was actively attacking women. And, um, so we, we, you know, we're going to get into that a little bit, but, uh, as far as I know, nobody has been apprehended for this crime and it's still a cold case. It's still a cold case. So... Um, we're going to start with, um, uh, in a nutshell, I'm going to tell you what happened in a tiny paragraph, and then we're going to go and backtrack um, from her background and then the day before the incident and what happened that night that she disappeared and on and on. And so it might be quite a lengthy case because um, this is filled with detail that Tammy's absolutely wasn't. Um, so, uh, let's begin. Now, the uh, girl who vanished was Melanie Nadia Evier, 
and uh, she vanished on September 28th, 1996, at approximately, go figure, 2 a.m. And so um, Melanie was seen for the last time as she left a friend's residence to walk the short distance uh, to her own residence in New Liskard, Ontario. Now, I'm, I'm not familiar with that area and I haven't researched it. There's time for that. Um, so the distance between her home and her friend's residence was the same distance that uh, Cheryl Hansen walked the day that she vanished, one kilometer, but um, about six blocks. But Melanie never arrived home that night or that morning, I should say. So foul play is still suspected. Okay, let's get into the background. Um, in September 1996, um, Melanie stood five foot five, um, almost the same height as Tammy. Um, she weighed approximately 120 pounds, had brown eyes and long, um, braided hair, which she may have worn in dreadlocks. Um, she was very, very fond of wearing hair extensions. And so um, she, at that time, had not ever been diagnosed with any medical or mental issues and was not taking any medications whatsoever. And friends who knew her at the time of her disappearance do not believe that she was suffering from any um, undiagnosed condition. Like she wasn't acting weird. She was a good kid. She was well behaved. She had a good head on her shoulders. And so um, that those are the facts. Now, um, Melanie was at that time um, a high school student. Now, Melanie was born Christmas Day, uh, 1980. So in 1996, when she vanished, she was 16 years old. And so um, she attended um, a, a French second Catholic secondary school in um, New Liscard, Ontario. And so Melanie has been described as being the absolute salt of the earth. She was wonderful and amazing. And um, she had a lovely personality. She was the daughter of Celine Evier, whose family had moved to the, that area when she was six years old. So she had been there all her life, pretty much 10 years. And so um, she, this um, Celine Evier uh, acted as a second mother to her sister, Jesse, who was five years old in September um, 1996. So I, what I think um, I just said was that um, Melanie was a second mother to the little girl and not Celine. So Celine was the mother and she had um, these two girls at home. And so, um, Jessie was the younger girl, and um, in, in 1996, Jessie was five years old, and so it would have been her big sister that went missing. So she was one of the um, only three black girls, Afro-American girls, in that community. And now Melanie's father, with whom she had no relationship, was from Botswana and met her mother. He met her mother while she attended, while he attended mining school in a neighboring um, Haleybury town. So he had come to Ontario and that is where he met Melanie's mother. But he was relocated um, to another mining school during the pregnancy of Melanie, uh, and then he returned to Africa once his schooling was complete. I'm not that surprised. A lot of men don't consider, um, you know, getting someone 
in that way um, as a, a reason to get married. So, um, like Tammy, uh, this is sad, like Tammy, um, Melanie was from a single mother family. Yeah. And so, at the time of her disappearance, the um, population of New Liskard and its other communities that were surrounding it, it was roughly 11,000. So it was not that big, but it was not that small either. So uh, Melanie was employed at a local daycare, um, and um, she taught self-defense. Um, she was learning, actually, self-defense from a family friend. She intended to become, Melanie intended to become a teacher after graduating from high school. And so she was going to further her education. And uh, the daycare where she worked was attached to her high school. And so that's very often um, a, a good way for a, a high school students to get started on their vocation in life. And so um, Melanie would open the facility early in the morning. I, I had a job like that. <laughs> and uh, remain until it closed in the evening. So in between, she attended school. I, I had a job exactly like that, and it was a very pleasant job. Um, it was an after-school program. You, you went in early, and you closed up late. And in between... You could do whatever you want, you know. Um, it was a nice job. I loved it. And so um, it was the last job that I had before I began teacher's college. And so she had, I can tell this girl had a very good head on her shoulders because it, it takes a lot of patience to work with children and then have your own life as well. So um, anyway, uh, let's go down to the day um, that she went missing. Now, let's start in the early part of the day. We're going to review what she did. And everything has been documented by witnesses and people who spent time with her that day. And so um, that day, uh, on the morning of Saturday, September 28th, 1996, Melanie visited the home of her mother's close friend. This is important. Um, Sylvia or Sylvie Chartrand. Only Melanie Chartrand or Sylvie and um, Sylvie's six-year-old daughter, Stephanie, were at the house um, because Chartrand's partner, who is the suspect in this case, um, Dennis Lavelle, we'll call him Dennis, and her son, Jason, were both out of, of town. Wow. She let her son go with him. But I'm not basing this on suspicion. Um, I'm basing this on documented fact. So we'll be going over this gentleman and his situation very carefully. And so um, during that morning visit, Melanie broke a nail. Wow, I, I broke so many. Um, I don't have any left and I'm not even finished the balcony yet. I know it's a crappy feeling. Um, and so um, she, she broke a nail and it, it caused her to become really irritated and upset. So, um, but there were other things going on in Melanie's life at home that were contributing to her, um, you know, kind of low um, self-esteem at the moment. And so Chartrand later speculated that Melanie's disappointment over her broken nail was compounded by the family's financial difficulties as their car was um, out of service and the phone system had been cut off from their house uh, the previous day due to unpaid bills. Oh, well, I paid my bills and my service was always cut off. So, wow. Um, 
go figure. So um, anyway, um, Melanie left the house of uh, Sylvie. She left Sylvie's house and traveled downtown. And I, I would assume she took the public transit. So because it's it's very apparent that she did not own a car or drive. And so um, she purely coincidentally uh, ran into her best friend at a bus stop outside of the public library, the local public library downtown. And her friend who had been doing homework in the library decided right then and there to abandon her schoolwork and join Melanie. And what? Um, so what the two girls did then was they visited several locations and knew Liskard, including a pizza pizza where they had lunch. And so it was over pizza that day that Melanie uh, went over the idea aloud of becoming a teacher and, and volunteering in Botswana, the, the country her father um, her biological father was from. I, I think that would have really irritated her mother, um, Celine. I think that really would have irritated Celine. Um, I don't know. So um, anyway, um, Melanie purchased candies, candles, frosting, candy hearts, and a new cake pan to make a cake for her grandmother's birthday, which was going to be celebrated the next day. Um, the day before her grandparents went out of town. And so um, that's very sweet. I would simply have bought one, right? Anyway, um, so um, the, the, the girls also visited a house in nearby Diamond to collect money from someone. Okay, that doesn't sound too good. And so um, Melanie had, oh, okay, Melanie babysat for this family, and so they went to get the money. Okay, at some point, the girls um, met with Melanie's boyfriend, Neil Fortier, who she had been dating for about a month. And their friends, um, Dave Bromley and Jay Denome and Ryan Chatwin. So um, Neil described Melanie as being in a good mood that day and night. So we have two different, two different um, stories. Um, Sylvie said she was not in a good mood and uh, Neil said she was in a great mood. Okay. But you know, young people, their moods go up and down because they're young. Um, they're easily affected by a lot of different things. Who knows? So the group stopped in a video rental store around um, 9.30, um, 9, 9.30. And so, because I assume they would have closed down at about uh, 9 nine-ish and so um i'm trying to think back because those places are all gone now it would have been about nine-ish that they close up and so they rented the movie sudden death oh boy at 10 p.m that evening the group arrived at um melanie's home to watch the movie and melanie's mother was spending time with um, the grandmother in their living room and suggested that her bedroom was too disorderly for hosting guests. I guess they had an argument. You can't have friends in your bedroom. <laughs> anyway, um, although um, given the choice to watch the film in her bedroom, Melanie told the teens that they would have to watch the movie downstairs or, or uh, actually somewhere else. So they left the residence. Gee, I wonder what was up with that. I'm sure she didn't leave the house because the room was too messy. Uh, maybe they had a bit of an argument. That's typical. Um, so anyway, um, 
The group then attempted to watch the movie at Bromley's home and uh, at Bromley's girlfriend's house, Samia Benchabi, Samia, that's a nice name, who was unable to host them as their family was preparing for a move, but joined them briefly as they walked to another house. Why do kids do this? Why do they do this? Her parents didn't know where she was. Um, 1996. Yeah, there were cell phones around, but still. Um, I don't hear anything about a cell phone in this story. So obviously she didn't have one, I'm assuming. Uh, Samia left the group when they reached the Armstrong Street Bridge, at which point she returned home. So um, I guess there was something about that bridge that was not too comfy. Um, Melanie's female friend complained that the air had turned very cold around this time. And so um, shortly after 10 p.m., the group relocated to a house on Pine Avenue where Ryan lived. And so um, Ryan's parents were home but they were both asleep in their bedroom. And so um, 10 p.m., the early, early uh, rises, I guess, um, I'm impressed. So um, the house was roughly 10, 12 minutes from Melanie's home, or about six blocks. And so according to the kids who were present, the teens watched a movie quietly in the basement while Ryan's parents slept upstairs, and they consumed no alcohol or drugs th that evening. But I wonder if they were in the habit of normally doing so. Um, not that it would make any difference because Melanie wasn't with any of them when this happened to her. So before the movie finished, um, Denome uh, left the house uh, around um, 12.30, 1 a.m., and returned to his house. So he wasn't there when she left. Melanie's female friend also left early to catch a ride to Haleybury, which is a close by town, and she departed around um, 12.30, 1 a.m. Okay. And so while leaving the house, um, this was, um, the female friend. She encountered, um, a really suspicious vehicle. And I get this all the time, guys, night or day, no matter where I go. Um, uh, as she tried to cross, as, uh, Melanie's friend, who was alone, tried to cross the intersection um, this car, uh, slowed down and tried to approach her and she became so petrified that she ran from that intersection to the next one by the Armstrong Street Bridge, which was, uh, very well lit. And so she followed the same route that Melanie probably took, um, to her own home later. And so um, Melanie's grandparents were waiting to take her home. And so um, she arrived at, um, hold on guys, this is confusing. I didn't write this, <laughs> hold on. Okay, so what I think is going on is that Melanie's friend went to Melanie's house, so um, Melanie's grandparents could drive her home. That was so confusing. Um, so um, when Heather's, when Melanie's friend did arrive at the grandparents at, at Melanie's home, um, she remembered catching, it was just before 1 a.m. And I remember Saturday Night Live, she saw the last few minutes and it used to be on at that time. And so, and then they drove her home. 
So Melanie's grandparents drove her friend home. That's nice. And Melanie got stuck. I don't understand this very well. Why didn't Melanie just go with her? I, I'm not criticizing anything. I'm just wondering. It's so, it's so bizarre. It's incredible for me to believe that this girl walked home without Melanie and now Melanie's missing. Why didn't they just go home together? I don't understand it. Um, that is indeed very strange. And so um, that, it, it, you know what? Um, the I'm going to describe the vehicle that was swarming uh, Melanie's friend. And then we're going to call it a night because um, this is very, very involved. And I want to make sure I get all the details right. This is very involved. And so the vehicle that um, the friend encountered, now this would be the same friend that she went to the library with um, that day. It was a white or light colored Chevrolet Monte Carlo. My mom had one. I know exactly what it looks like. And, um, or it would, it would have been similar to that model with two doors and signs of being in poor condition. That doesn't sound like my mom's. My mom's was a four door and it was always the way I remember it, brand new with a tea roof. It was beautiful. So um, anyway, um, the, it had a gray patch on the right side, which was likely hiding a hole. So it was taped up guys. Uh, I see that from time to time. Um, it was hiding a hole or other damage. God knows what he hit. Maybe a fence, maybe a person, maybe an animal. Um, the witness believes that the occupants were two teenage boys or young men. It was kind of hard to tell, but she can't remember ever seeing that car ever again. And probably it had been the first time that she ever noticed it. At the time of um, her departure from that house, only three people remained. Melanie, Neil, and Ryan. Wow. That doesn't sound... It sounds weird to me, guys. It sounds weird. Uh, it, it sounds weird that Melanie wouldn't have gone with her friend. I don't know what's going on. Um, unfortunately, that's what happened. So uh, let's call this a night. And so far I have introduced you to Melanie and the case, and we will um, discuss the rest of it and certain parts, um, in sequential parts, of course, but um, probably tomorrow. I'm not sure about the following night, but uh, we will continue in a chronological order, and I'm not gonna put another Madeline McCann review in between. I'm gonna do this one without any more interruption, but um, I will be making a recipe this weekend, so I'll probably give this one more go before continuing after the recipe. So I forget my drift. And um, anyway, thank you very much for coming along with me today. And um, thank you for watching and listening. And please don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.